curiously. But welcome. As I said, we're beginning our Faces of God series. Um, I am so excited about it. The way this is going to play out is today is kind of an introduction, and what I'm going to do is introduce kind of a general concept that I want you to keep in mind as we walk through this series about the different ways that God or Spirit, whatever name you call, appears in our lives. Next week, Melody LeBaron is going to do a talk on the Divine Feminine from a shamanic and a priestess perspective. That is going to be way cool because she's going to bring a bunch of friends and we're going to have music. And it's just going to be, I can't even describe it, it's going to be very exciting. So please be here and bring your friends. It's going to be way fun. The week after that, what we're going to explore a little bit is what I call um, non-God spirituality. And that is what we're seeing a lot of today is people who are leaving, leaving church, leaving organized religion, and they're going into things like ethical living, secular humanism. And they are adopting many of, of the same principles that we do, but they're just saying this is not God, this is the way I am living as a human expressing in this world. And we're going to talk about that because that's an interesting movement. Um, after that, Jeannie Ward is talking, and she's going to talk about the presence of God as kind of non-gender, and she's going to encourage us to look at God in a more open way. Um, and the week after that, August 28th, I'm going to talk about a concept I'm going to introduce today, which is the three faces of God, and how we can benefit from an integral approach to all three faces. So it's going to be way cool, so please come back. I think you're going to enjoy it. Yes, you're going to enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> so, as we begin our series on the many faces of God, what I found as I researched this talk and as I got ready for this series is that the descriptors, the many descriptors of the faces of God are limited only by our own ability to conceptualize, imagine, and articulate the magnificence of the divine in all its awesomeness and also in all its intimacy. When we think of spirit, we tend to think of spirit in one facet, but there is so much more, and that's what I want to bring to you in this series. As we've learned more about the world in which we live and the cosmos which surround us, our images and our understanding of the divine has just expanded. We've gone from cave paintings. Um, they tell me that the earliest manifestations of religion in the Neanderthal phase was intentional burial of the dead. Okay, so we've moved beyond that. And now we have much more massive and greater and more complex understanding of the divine. But we still look, we are still what Nietzsche called God seekers from that time to this. So that is what we're going to do in this series. We're going to do a little bit of God seeking. My goal is to increase our awareness of the presence of the divine, the different ways the divine shows up to us and the many different faces we see. So today, we're in a position our forebearers were not. In centuries past, what would we do? We would live with people who looked like us. We would worship with people who looked like us. We would be exposed only to people who looked and lived and thought like us. Barriers of geography and of time prevented us from being exposed to the sheer multiplicity of cultures and religions and practices around the globe. We were not exposed to the many other faces of the divine that are around the world. The world was a much larger place. It was a much more separated place. When people left, they wouldn't come back for five years and you wouldn't know if they were ever returning. It's not like that now. Our world now is immediate. It's intimate. It's here. It's the world of tweets, of the internet, of being exposed immediately to all the different cultural practices, all the religious practices, all the huge, diverse variety of life going on around the globe. If you have access to the internet, you are by default a global citizen. You are a practitioner, a possible student of all the world's different faith traditions. The walls of geography, nationality, and culture are just down. Those barriers are busted. You are no longer limited to the aspects of God, the faces of God that your parents knew. It is a new world. We are opened up and we are free to draw from all faith traditions as we create and as we walk our own spiritual paths. And that's one of the things we celebrate here at One World. That's one of the things I love about this community is we are creating our paths as we go, drawing from all the faith traditions available to us. So we here in the West, 
we have learned so much from Eastern faith traditions, and I'm going to talk about those a little bit. They invite us to new awarenesses, to new practices, and what is great, at the same time, they also open us up to new understandings of our own faith traditions. I think it was Thich Nhat Hanh who said, when you see other faith traditions, you are also looking at your own. So what we do is they teach us not to reject those we have grown up with and those we can still embrace. They just open us up to new and rich aspects that we might have forgotten or we might have overlooked. So many of you might be familiar with the work of Ken Wilber. Is anybody here familiar with the work of Ken Wilber? Excellent. Ken Wilber is a mystic, a philosopher, a profoundly creative thinker who is the founder of a concept known as integral theory. A component of this is integral spirituality. If you are interested, get on YouTube. You will see him talking. It's W-I-L-B-E-R, Ken Wilber. He is just a giant. I have heard him described as one of the most important philosophers of the 20th and the 21st century. Don't, don't miss out an opportunity to learn some of his thinking. His writing can be heavy sledding but it's worth it. I invite you to listen. No, he's laughing. He's like, oh my God. Uh, yeah, it can be. If you think Charles Fillmore is tough, try Ken Wilber. Oh, oh, Seriously. Anyway, it is worth it. It is worth studying this. So he actually published a book in 2006 by the name Integral Spirituality, a startling new role for religion in the modern and the postmodern world. So I'm going to be talking more about integral spirituality on the 28th. That's when I'm going to talk about the three faces and how we might benefit from, from embracing all three faces. But right now, I want to explore a little bit more about the concept that I spoke about, the three faces of God, which is the way he articulated the way he perceives God appears in the major faith traditions. He writes that all the major faith traditions of the world see God in three basic ways. Now think about this, because we're going to come back to this through the series. Three basic ways. First person, second person, and third person. I, you, and it. This is very fun stuff. I love this stuff. So think about this, and I invite you to look for this in your own life. First, and this is familiar to us, Asha was just talking about it, we experience God as us. God as the ground of being, as Paul Tillich noted. This is a face that we're very familiar with. We are expressions of the divine. We say this every week. We are God in expression. We are manifestations of God here on earth. This is the first face of God, the I. God as me. And we are all familiar with it. The third face of God, we also know here in New Thought. This is God in all creation. This is God as all there is. God as the the huge, universal, supreme reality, embracing all that is, but being so much more than the sum of the parts. We look at a sunset. We look at a newborn baby, a mountain range. We witness the compassion of strangers or simple acts of kindness or connection. That is the God where we know that there is a creator at work. This is where we see beauty in nature, in humanity, and we just know, we just feel deeply that this is not random and that we are a part of this breathtaking whole. That is God as all that is. This is the third face and we are also comfortable and we know about that because that is a, is a face of God that we also mm -hmm. celebrate. Then we get to the second face and this is where some of us hit a bump in the road. And this is going to be a challenge for us as we go through this series, but we are up to it. I know it. <laughs> the second face is the aspect that many of us knew from childhood. This is God in relationship. This is what Martin Buber called the I-Thou, where Ken Wilber paraphrases Buber by saying, God is in the hyphen between the I and the Thou. This is the God that is the other that we pray to, that we turn to for support, that is out there, who supports us and loves us, but is not us. This may be the God that we believe judges us, watches us, finds us either worthy or wanting. This is the face of God that many in New Thought have rejected. And a lot of us grew up in traditional Protestant Christianity or Catholicism or Judaism, and this is the face that just did not feel right. 
and we came to New Thought, and we, we learned that, oh, God is us. This is so much cooler than God being out there. But what I'm going to do, do in this series is invite you to think about that second face. Now, Wilbur teaches us that no major faith tradition incorporates all three faces. Some, I mean, all incorporate one, some incorporate two, but none of them really incorporate all three. Different traditions emphasize different aspects or faces. But this is his basic premise, and this is what I'm going to invite us to consider. He teaches that true spiritual wholeness, true awakening, comes from embracing all three faces. And this is what he calls an integral approach. The richness of God can only be completely understood, to the extent we can completely understand it at all, by embracing all three faces. Each face reflects the truth of God, but each face, he says, is only a partial truth. And that we become fully whole in our spirituality by embracing all three of them. So keep that in mind as we walk through this series. So, using that concept, First person, second person, third person, I, you, and it. Let's take a quick look at how God appears in the major faith traditions. I found that it was similar and it was also very different. So let's start with what we call the Abrahamic traditions. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Now, those of us who come from a traditional Christian background, Protestant, Catholic, whatever, know that the Christian faith tradition, as it is generally practiced today, emphasizes the second face. Correct? Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody is going to disagree with that. The God that is the other. This is what we know as the relational face of God. Me in relation to God. I remember many years ago, we were putting one of our kids in a private school around here, and he, we had taken him out of a, of a religious school, and we were putting him in another school. So I said to the principal, as we were having your parent orientation, I said, well, what, you know, kind of, what do you teach about religion here? Is there any religious component? And he said, well, really not much. We just teach the kids that there is a God, and it's not them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. That is the second face of God. <laughs> so the face of the truth, the face of God that you're going to see in traditional Christianity to them today is the I am God and you are not face. Correct? It's the God that says, come to me and I will give you rest. Come to me because I am with you always. God may be judgmental, it's always a he. He may be loving and intimate, but we are sure that he is the other. So remember our talk on duality? Oneness and duality? This is a God that exists in duality. This is a God that exists separate from me. It may love me. He may judge me. He may support me. He may make me wonderfully wealthy and rich and abundant, but he is the other. God is experienced as a living intelligence with whom we can, we can relate, generally through prayer. So for those who are familiar with 12-step spirituality, that is also the God of the other. When we call upon a higher power, when we surrender to a higher power, that is our interaction with the second face of God with the other. Now, as we'll talk about it later, that may be a view that we need to consider. And I'm going to invite us to do that as we move on. Okay. However, even though that God is the other, we don't need to lose sight of the fact that that God still has many different faces. Not just one face. Throughout the Christian scriptures, God is called the Lamb, the King, Light, the Good Shepherd, as we all know from the 23rd Psalm, the Comforter, the Almighty and Eternal, the Alpha, the Omega, and many, many other faces, many other names. Each of these names reflects an aspect of the divine in relationship with people of the time, in relationship with us now. This relational God was intimate enough connected enough to participate fully in the lives of these people, not simply as an abstract other, but as a committed actor in these human events. Sometimes, I mean, the, the, the qualities of God that you will see in the second face, and particularly in the Christian scriptures, is just like a human being, except with really cool powers. You know, jealous, petty, angry, loving, forgiving, all those things that we can be, but just with different powers than we have, omnipotent, omniscient, but still relating to us as, human, as humans do relate. So 
While traditional Christianity fully embraces the second face of God, the other two faces, the first and the third, are either given honorable mention or they're totally rejected. We may have a spark of divinity. Christianity teaches that we have a spark of the divine in us. But I will tell you, if any traditional Christian goes around saying, I am God, that is not going to work out. <laughs> I think I told you a while back of when I was about 10 years old, I was going on in our junior choir or something, and I wrote on the blackboard in big words, I am God. I am God. And the minister came in and almost had an aneurysm. <laughs> I mean, he says, no, you are not. And I found that I was right. But not in that context. <laughs> back then, I was not right. Okay. So there is also a place in traditional Christianity for the third face of God. God that, all is, that is all there is. We still feel a sense of awe. We still can look out and say, this is God. Now, God is the creator. Those things are not God itself. So it's kind of a hybrid third face. But there still is a place for the third face of God in the traditional Christian church. So let's look at the other Abrahamic traditions, Judaism and Islam. You'll see that the second face of God is really emphasized in all three of them. I remember on July 10th we had Kamal Karusu here. I was not here, but I watched his talk on YouTube and I really enjoyed it. Remember, he told the story of Jonah. As it's told in the Quran, um, after Jonah was in the belly of the fish, he recited the prayer that Jonah gave. The Quran says Jonah's prayer was simple. It was, there is no God but you. You are the only one and you are the glorified one. For sure, I have become the wrongdoer. This is a very second face God, a relational God. The Allah of the Quran is omnipotent, awesome, fear inspiring. The Quran states, all that is in the heavens and in the earth magnifies God. He is the all strong, the all wise. He gives life and he brings on death. And he is omnipotent over all other things. This is not the God within. This is the God in relationship. However, what the Quran also emphasizes is not judge God's judgment or fear of God, but it is God's mercy and compassion. Some of the names for Allah, some of the 99 names for Allah in Islam are the holy, the peaceful, the faithful, the guardian over his servants, the shelter of the orphan, the guide of the, of the uh, ailing, the deliverer from every affliction, the friend of the bereaved, the consoler of the afflicted, the compassionate, the merciful, the very forgiving, whose love for man is more tender than that of a mother bird for her young. That is the image. Those are the faces that we see. It's still relational. But one of the things that I want us to consider as we move through is our, what are the faces we see as we go through our day, as we go through our lives? Even if we call on the second face of God, which I do sometimes because it's comforting and it's known, what are the faces that we see, that we need, that we call up? Like the God of Christianity, Allah has many of these different faces and different names. Now, in Islam, there is really not a lot of room for the first for the first face of God, the I am God face. Man was created in order to worship Allah and for no other reason. The word Islam means surrender or submission. And your role is to surrender to God. <clears throat> so one of the aspects that I hope to explore as we move on, again, is the possibility that we may be giving short shrift to this second face. Not in terms of the need to surrender, but just to consider what richness it can bring to our own spiritual practices. One of the things that affected me here was just watching Kamal. Were you all here for his talk or did you see it? As I watched him, I really got a sense of the love and the genuine support that just emanated from him in his relationship with this second face of God. I mean, he's just a wonderful man. He is peaceful, he is loving. He is full of integrity, and his relationship with God, as I perceive in his talk, is a second face relationship. And he gets something profoundly wonderful from it. And I think it behooves us to figure out what that can be for us. So let's talk about the God of Judaism, the first Abrahamic tradition. 
Not surprisingly, this is also a second face God. Yahweh is all powerful, but he is also the God of love and compassion. Now, in the Jewish scriptures, this God was supremely interested in human affairs, choosing the Israelites as his chosen people, leading them out of Egypt, the whole pillar of fire thing, the Red Sea, uh, slaughtering their enemies, selecting their rulers, telling them how to behave and how not to behave. This was a very close and intimate daily relationship. Yahweh was a God that judged, loved, punished, supported, and led. This was not a distant God. Even though this God was in relational, he was in your face in that tradition. So we see that the concept and view of God in all the Abrahamic faith traditions is really quite similar. And that's actually not surprising because the traditional Abrahamic, in, in all the Abrahamic traditions, it's the same God that is being worshipped when you go through the timeline. Indeed, Islam does not consider itself a new religion. It considers itself a clarification of the existing Abrahamic faith tradition. Islam teaches that Judaism is limited because it was limited to the Israelites. It was only limited to God's chosen people. Islam believes that Christianity kind of went off the rails when we decided that Jesus was divine. Because Islam, if nothing else, is a supremely monotheistic religion. And if you have a man who is also divine, that means you have more than one God, and that is not the way it works. So what Islam believes is that we are all worshiping the same God, by whatever name. But its goal is to set the record right on how we approach that God. All three faith traditions see themselves as worshiping, and I use that word advisedly, the same God. Okay, so that's the Western tradition by and large. And I also want to say these are gross generalizations. I mean, there are so many rich traditions within these, and also in other Western faith traditions, but in 25 minutes, this is, you know, kind of an overview, so I, I ask you to forgive me for that. So, let's turn our view to the East. When we move east, the situation changes. And the religions I want to look at there are Hinduism and Buddhism. And they have a very different view of ultimate reality. A couple of weeks ago, a group of us visited the Hindu Mandir or the Hindu Temple in Lilburn, and we had a great time. We also learned a good deal about Hinduism. Now, one of the first things we noticed was in the temple there are many different statues of numerous deities, men, women, some children, brightly dressed, different expressions on their faces, human deities um, scattered throughout the Mandir. So your first impression might be that Hinduism is a polytheistic religion, which it is not. The word Hinduism is used to refer to a variety of people and beliefs. Um, it's not even a religion. We call it a religion. We say Hinduism is a religion, but it's really not. It started out as a geographic descriptor. Many Hindus today prefer the term Sanatana Dharma, which means the eternal balance, the way, the truth, or the path. But we're going to continue calling it Hinduism today just because it's easier, and that's the name by which most know these diverse faith traditions. When I point that out, one of the things you need to know about Hinduism is that it's not one faith tradition. It's millions of different believers, many of whom ascribe to different theories, different beliefs, and different practices. You cannot put Hinduism in a small box. It's just totally impossible. It's not based on one book, but it's based on beliefs and traditions developed over hundreds of years by many different people. But what most Hindus believe, what Hinduism incorporates generally, is a much stronger first-person face than we see in the West the God within, or the ground of all being. For many Hindus, the purpose of our presence here on life, here on earth, is to awaken to the point where we merge with God, or ultimate reality, which is called Brahma. I know you all are familiar with that word. Our inner soul, our Atman, is seen as one with Brahman, and as we develop through the stages of life, from child, to adolescence, to worker, to elder, we are able to unite our human spirit, our Atman, with the Brahman. So what the Hindu sees is not so much an external God, but a search for the God within, the Brahman, which is at the center of our own being.
need. God is transcendent, is imminent, both creator and unmanifest reality. So the Upanishads contain a great deal of Hindu philosophy. They teach that our world is ever-changing and it's perishable. And in that way, it's very similar to Buddhism, which is not surprising because Buddhism grew out of Hinduism. The supreme reality that pervades the world is eternal and unchanging. There is only one underlying reality, and our mission in life, the reason we are here, is to find it, to awaken to it, to develop into it. The body may die, but not the soul or the Atman. As you may know, Hindus believe, most Hindus believe, in reincarnation. So as we develop in life, we may not reach it in this life, but that is okay. Because they believe that every soul at some point is going to reach that goal, which is very comforting thought. We may not get it this time, but as we move forward, we will continue until we do get it. The Upanishad teaches, Tat Vam Asi, that thou art. We are all the Brahman. We are all the universal reality. And in that sense, the Eastern religions reject a separate or a personal God. The God is within. It is much more of a first person God. However, Hinduism also incorporates another face of God. There is a second face which Hinduism does include, which I think is very cool because unlike the Abrahamic traditions, Hinduism gives us two faces. This tradition comprehends that people have different personalities and different ways of appreciating the divine. People are just different. I approach God differently than you do. My personality is different. My inclinations are different. So what Hinduism does is it gives us the four yoga practices for different personalities to appreciate and approach God. The four are karma yoga, which is the yoga of action, the yoga of service. These are for people who want to get up and get out. They're not going to think about it. They're not going to be devotional. They're just going to get out and do. That is the path of karma yoga. Bhakti yoga is the yoga of love and devotion. These are the people who are more emotional. They're just going to worship God. They're going to feel devotional love toward God. They're going to look at some of those images that we saw in the mandir and lavish love and attention and devotion. And that's the way they approach God. Raja Yoga is the yoga of physical and mental control. This is the yoga of trying to master your body, of using your physical energies to bring you closer to God. And the last one is Janana Yoga, which is the yoga of knowledge and wisdom. That's for the intellectuals in the group. They just want to sit and think and read about it and meditate and pray, and they kind of get to it that way, more intellectually. But each is suited to a different temperament or to a different approach to life. All the paths lead ultimately to the same destination, to union with Brahman or God. Now, another thing that I liked about Hinduism is Hinduism fully embraces all different paths. Some faith traditions are going to say, my way or the highway. And if you don't come to God through X, through Allah, through Jesus, through whatever, you are just not going to make it. Not so with Hinduism. As you saw in our reading today that Tom read from Ramakrishna, all the paths lead to God. It doesn't matter which one you take. The, the point is that whatever path you take, you do it with full devotion, involving all of yourself, your heart and your soul and your energies. That is what will get you to God, not a specific path. When we look at those statues in the Mandir or in any Hindu temple, they are metaphorical representations of the divinity. Different aspects, all of which can, different faces, all of which add up to one divinity. God is so huge that there are literally dozens of faces, hundreds of faces. Our perspective is too limited to see them all. So it helps to see these physical representations. Nobody's worshiping those statues. They are worshiping what is represented, that path that access to the one supreme reality at the core of each of us. So the last one I'm going to talk about today, because I'm kind of running out of time, is Buddhism. And we're kind of familiar with that because we've talked about Buddhism here before. Buddhism, it's kind of funny when we talk about faces of God because there's really no concept of a God as we know it 
in Buddhism. And that's a big debate. Is Do Buddhists believe in God? Well, you know, yes and no. Buddhists may not believe in a guy on a cloud. Buddhists may not believe in the universal creator that set everything in motion. But Buddhists do believe generally in what, they can, what we can call the Godhead, which is the ultimate reality in each of us. The Buddhist searches for a complete connection with this Godhead and elimination of any concept of the self. If you ask the Dalai Lama or any Buddhist if they believe in a soul, the answer you might get is no. Because the goal of Buddhist practice is to eliminate the self. It's to merge with the great wholeness, the great reality. That is the way to eliminate suffering, is just to get rid of any concept of the self. So the way the Buddhists practice is they believe in the four noble truths none of which mention God. They are that life is suffering, the cause of suffering is attachment or desire, we can, we can release ourselves from attachment, and the way we do that is the Four Noble Truths, or the Eightfold Path, excuse me, the Eightfold Path. And what the Eightfold Path does is it gives us directions for living, right speech, right conduct, right thinking, none of which mention God. They mention how we behave on this earth, how we unfold our own souls. As a matter of fact, the Buddha, when people would ask him about God, he would just say that's metaphysical speculation. He didn't really engage in any of that. His practice was how we awaken here on earth. So this has been kind of a long introduction. And I've also, for, I've also eliminated some traditions. Paganism, for one. Wicca, we're going to talk about those later. But really the concept that I wanted to introduce today and get us to think about is these three faces of God and how God appears in our lives and how we relate on any given occasion to any particular, in any particular situation. So as we move forward, I'm going to invite you to consider what God looks like to you and which of the three faces of God you are seeing at any particular point. So let's take these thoughts.